Hello everyone, and now you've kind of caught me with my pants down trying to adjust my mic. It keeps getting too loose. Ah. There we go. Uh, anyway, hello everybody. Hope you all can hear me. I'm going to check this on the YouTube app on my phone to make sure that I am audible. Let's see here. All right, good deal. Looks like we are good. I have my uh, cheap ass wine cooler faux cocktail with low alcohol percentage, whatever this thing is. Uh, trailer park wine, I guess you could call it. And I've got Foucault. So let's get started. Um. This is chapter 7 of the Archaeology of Knowledge. This is a very important chapter because Foucault is kind of, uh, he, he's kind of putting his own method on trial here. He's kind of putting his own method on trial. He's taking his own historical method and going, look, if this is as great as I say it is, if this historical method of mine is as useful as I say it is, and if it has the virtues that I say it does, and if it is, bottom line, if it's going to do the things I say it will do, then it needs to be able to ascertain unities. And ascertain unities simply means um, all these things that I'm talking about, I'm speaking as Foucault here, all these things that I'm talking about, discursive formations and strategies and, uh, let's see, what are some other terms he uses? Uh, objects and enunciative modalities, and uh, how concepts are formed. If all these things that I'm talking about are real, or if not real, he wouldn't like that term. <laughs> if all these things that I'm talking about are actually going to be useful, then I need to show that they can actually be individuated. That is to say, well, here, I'll just read a little bit of the text. At the outset, I questioned those pre-established unities according to which one has traditionally divided up the indefinite, repetitive, prolific domain of discourse. My intention was not to deny all value to these unities or to try to forbid their use. It was to show that they required, in order to be defined exactly, a theoretical elaboration. So, to give an example, the book. Well, what's a book? And I know what everyone's saying is, well, Caleb, you dumbass, that's a book. Well, it's a little more complicated, though. Because take something like this. Take a very ancient text, like uh, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. This is uh, more than 2,000 years old, if my memory serves me correctly. Various things have been inserted into this. Various things have been taken out of this. Uh, this has been edited a number of times. The, the there, there may be the work of multiple authors represented here as being by one guy. There may be uh, some stuff in here that purports to be part of the original text, but is really commentary that was added later. So which book is the real Sun Tzu Art of War? So when you think about it, historically speaking, for any text, the question what is a book is a little bit more complicated than you might think. So the book is an example of what Foucault would call a historical unity. What's a book? You know, if there have been multiple editions, uh, you know, th this right here, Plato's Complete Works, is both a book and it also purports to be or wants to be an oeuvre, oeuvre, however you say it. I'm not sure exactly how, how it's pronounced, but over. I, I have no idea how to say it. I'm terrible at pronouncing French. Uh, but... This here purports to be um, something, purports to be a collection of all of Plato's work. And it's also a book. But what do we mean by Plato's entire corpus of work? Because that book I just showed you, that has a lot of stuff in it that wasn't even written by Plato, but that was ascribed to him at different points in history and is included for completeness. So what do we really mean by Plato's body of work? What do we really mean by everything Plato wrote? These supposedly rock-solid 
uh, ideas that we have, these concepts that seem like they're so obvious. Like, oh, I know what a book is. Well, I mean, what really is a book in the context of history? When does uh, Plato's complete works become the text we know it as today? And at what point was it the real text, if it ever was? Or, you know, Beowulf. I have a copy of Beowulf over there. Beowulf is, was a poem that was originally transmitted orally. It wasn't even written down until Christian monks started writing down North European myths. Um, what was the real Beowulf? There's a lot of stuff in that book about Christianity that was probably not a part of the original myths before Christian missionaries arrived in Northern Europe. So where's the real book? So a lot of these unities or a lot of these sort of ideas or these things that we think of as being unchallengeable, or not unchallengeable, that seem obvious, are really not so obvious. But Foucault runs into an issue here. Because he wants to say, okay, I know how all this stuff works. I know what a book is. I know what a body of work or an oeuvre is. I know what, uh, what a system of taxonomy is. I know what a theory is, and I can define it all using the stuff I lay out in my book, The Archaeology of Knowledge. But then he runs into this issue, because he has to go, okay, wait a second. Wait a second. All these tools and all these theories I'm using to explain this stuff, I'm kind of superimposing that stuff onto this, aren't I? So... How can I prove that the stuff that I'm adding to the body of texts we have is really any more valid than the concept of a book? Yeah, I can talk about discursive regularities and the formation of strateg strategies and enunciative modalities, but how are any of those things any more certain or any more real or able to characterize or in be in some way logically anterior to the things that I say I'm explaining? How can my discursive forma formation come first before the concept of a book? How can my concept of an enunciative modality be primary over be, be primary over an oeuvre? And those are a lot of really good questions, but he can't answer them all here. So the one th question he is trying to answer is is the redivision that I am proposing capable of individualizing wholes? So what Foucault is saying there is, okay, so can does this system I've created, if you apply it to history, does it give you back anything? Think of Foucault's system as like a mathematical function. And all the stuff that goes into the function on the left side here are all the data, all the historical texts. Well, what comes out of the right side of that function, figuratively speaking, has to be things that actually make sense. It has to be individual objects that we can work with and use to theorize. Hang on. Um, Mike was uh, being janky for a second. Um... And feel free, uh, whoever all is watching, to go ahead and uh, ask any questions you may have in the chat box. And what is the nature of the unity thus discovered or reconstructed? Or constructed, rather. Okay, so he, he, he sets out, he says, we set out with an observation. With the unity of a discourse like that of clinical medicine or political economy or natural history, we are dealing with a dispersion of elements. If there really is a unity, it does not lie in the visible, horizontal coherence of the elements formed. It resides well in t anterior to their formation in the system that makes possible and governs that form formation. So, uh, Zipetotech the Flayed God says, Caleb, great to have you back, brother. Hope you're taking care of yourself. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you. Uh, much love. I am in the midst of changing careers right now, um, and I'm... <sighs> Lots of stuff going on. So that's why my videos have been sparse lately. It's a lot of stuff going on, but still working on it. 
and thank you, thanks for uh, for the affection and support. So anyway, what Foucault is saying here is that if you want to take a system of dispersion, basically, a system of dispersion is a rule, a discursive formation that governs the dispersion of objects in the discourse. And what we mean by that, for example, is if you look in the uh, if you look in the 1700s, there are all these different um, theories. Well, no, let's, let's use something else. In the 1600s, around the Enlightenment, you have the three Enlightenment philosophers, the big three, so-called Leibniz, Spinoza, Descartes. And all three of them are sort of trying to grapple with the same sort of question, which is making a secure, solid foundation to all of knowledge so that science can be pursued. So you have to ask yourself, what is the social backdrop of that? Because what Foucault is saying, what he means when he says... If there really is a unity, it does not lie in the visible horizontal coherence. It resides well anterior to their formation. So what uh, Foucault means by that, basically, is that if you want to know what the unity is between those three guys, Spinoza, Descartes, and Leibniz, as well as a lot of other uh, sort of less famous Enlightenment-era philosophers... If you want to know what the unity behind them is, don't try to look at the text and draw lines between this thing Descartes says and that thing Leibniz says and this way of thinking in Spinoza. Instead, look at the system, sort of the social and institutional backdrop that produced all three of them. And you'll find that all three were basically men of letters living in an era where instrumental rationality was taking off. They were living in a time period where the scientific revolution was happening, and it was like, okay, if we can just quantify everything, we can uh, consolidate control of the natural world or of human emotion or of, uh, or of motion or of physics or whatever. Basically, we can use science to create systems of control that will give us more power if we can apply instrumental rationality to things and quantify them. And that sort of social backing or that sort of backdrop, that sort of or institutional and social backdrop is what gives the unity to those three philosophers. Not anything they said really, but the, the socio-cultural and institutional backdrop in which they were working is what gave them that unity. Um, so he's saying the system that makes possible and governs their formation. So, so for example, look at the strategies, because remember um, what Foucault says about strategies. What does he say? That a strategy is... He, he, examples of strategy include, he has here back in chapter 6... Um, a theory in 19th century philology of a kinship between all the Indo-European languages. A theme in the 18th century of an evolution of the species deploying in time the continuity of nature. A theory propounded by the physiocrats of a circulation of wealth on the basis of agricultural production. Whatever their formal level may be, I shall call these themes and theories strategies. So, um, what is Foucault saying there? Hang on, let me get my phone set back up. So, what is what does Foucault mean with all this? And uh, if anybody else is here, please click the like button, please and thank you. So, a strategy, then, is sort of a way of grappling with things. Uh, Descartes uses the strategy of... He, he uses the strategy of skepticism, the methodological skepticism. Um, Linnaeus uses, Carl Linnaeus, the biologist, uses the strategy of creating a classificatory table and creating a taxonomy and classifying all organisms within this grand scheme, this tree of life. Um, so these strategies that everyone is using, or, or Immanuel Kant 
is using the strategy of examining reason itself to get clear on what it can or can't do, which then gives him a basis on which he can refute and rebut his opponents by saying, no, you're trying to do something with reason that by its own lights reason cannot do. Um, these are all strategies. So the strategies are created by institutions. Or not created, they're a result of institutions and social conditions. Kant used the strategy he did partially because of the uh, position he occupied in society as a professor, for example. So the real unity in all of this, these, this big body of historical texts that has come down to us is the unity of... Is the unity of the for, of the systems that govern formations, such as strategies, or and the strategies then produce all the different objects of discourse, such as the classificatory tables in Linnaeus's biology, or something like that. Um, first of all, he says, as we have seen, and there is probably no need to reiterate it. When one speaks of a system of formation, one does not only mean the juxtaposition, coexistence, or interaction of elements, but also the relation that is established by discursive practice. So, what's he saying there? Not just, he, you know, we're not just talking about the institutions and techniques and social groups. He doesn't just mean, like, all the stuff I was just saying about the institutions and sociocultural backdrop. But the relation between those things by virtue of the discourse that they produce. Okay, I see what he's saying. Because what he's getting at... Oh, Zipetotech the flayed god says, Foucault discussed systems of control moving from one enclosure to another, school barracks hospital. Is the internet one giant enclosure system of control? I'll get back to it. Because what Foucault is trying to say is um, that it's not just about the institutions and them somehow dominating discourse and discourse is just epiphenomenal on the institutions and the sociocultural backdrop. He's not saying, for example, oh, whatever, Linnaeus's taxonomy is just some fluff, some sea foam on top of the ocean of institutional power. Oh, no, 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 no. The discourses that are produced establish the relations between those institutions. So, yeah, the uh, psych psychologists of the 20th century might have produced all these Freudian ideas following after Freud. But that wasn't just a way for the psychologist to exert power. It established a relation between the psychologists and certain other things. For example, um, in the criminal justice system, if a person could be declared to be mentally unwell, be declared to be insane, then that would change how they were punished and change how the criminal justice system dealt with them. If someone is insane, then you cannot punish them in the same way, or you have to take a different course of action with them and they have to be treated differently. So... The discourse produced by psychologists, the discourses about madness, for example, or the discourses about insanity, were a way for the psychologists to, um... were a way for psychology to establish a relationship with another system of power. The psychologists are one system of power, institutional psychology. Another system of power is the criminal justice system, and psychology can exert an influence over the criminal justice system, or sort of establish a relationship to it by means of the, its discourses about insanity. So that's one thing that Foucault would like us to keep in mind. Now, uh, to address Zipetetek's uh, question, Foucault discussed systems of control moving from one enclosure to another, school barracks hospital. Is the internet one giant enclosure system of control? No. It is very much a, a, a field on which power relations can take place, but the internet is radically decentralized in a way that does not make it a system of control. Now, people do use it. You know, uh, institutions buy advertising space on Facebook and try to show you ads for political candidates. That's one really obvious way. Um, and also, uh, you have things like news outlets becoming very panicky because people are getting their news from people on YouTube. Or universities suddenly getting very miffed because some uh, hack YouTube guy 
is reading books to people and they're listening to him instead of looking up podcasts by accredited, qualified people in academia. Not that you shouldn't do that. It's totally fine. I, I look at some of that stuff. But the point is, is that it's the Internet is upsetting a lot of established power structures that were around before it. Um, and I think one of the really fascinating thing is the radical democratization of power and influence that has occurred with the Internet. You know, I've got 1,600 followers on this thing. I can fire up a live stream whenever I want, and at least a small group of people will show up to watch. I basically have a... It's a very small, very modest amount of power, but the Internet really has made it possible for anyone who is eloquent enough and knows what they're doing and knows how to influence to establish a presence and get some kind of reach. Maybe not a ton, but they can get some. And that's one reason why so many institutions are trying to regulate the internet, but they can't regulate it too much because that kills the internet. And if you kill the internet, you kill the cash cow where all their money's tied up. So there's a limit on how much they can do. They can only cut so much off before they start to cut their own fingers. Um, anyway. So that's number one. Two, uh, these systems of formation must not be taken as blocks of immobility, static forms that are imposed on discourse from the outside, and that define once and for all its characteristics and possibilities. They are not constraints whose origin is to be found in the thoughts of men, or in the play of their representations, but nor are they determinations which, formed at the level of institutions or social or economic relations, transcribe themselves by force on the surface of discourses. So what Foucault is saying there, essentially, uh, what Foucault means when he says that things uh, transcribe themselves by force onto the surface of discourses, or that they don't do that, is he's saying, look, all this discursive stuff is not something that is di that is imposed on discourse, or imposed on human thought, or imposed on the way that people talk to each other from the outside. He's not saying that everything we see in the historical record, all the books and all the texts and all the uh, poetry, literature, all the recording, all the recorded stuff, all the psychological stuff, all the medical records, he's not saying that that stuff is all just produced and dominated entirely by power structures. He's saying that discourse itself has a role that it can play in the interplay of structures of power. That's what Foucault means when he says that. What, and, he, and let's see what else here. Uh, what are described as systems of formation do not constitute the terminal stage of discourse if by that term one means the texts or words as they appear with their vocabulary, syntax, logical structure, or rhetorical organization. Analysis remains anterior to this manifest level which is that of the completed construction. In defining the principle of distributing, distributing objects in a discourse, it does not take into account all of their connections, their delicate structure, or their internal subdivisions. In seeking the law of the dispersion of concepts, it does not take into account all the processes of elaboration. In short, it leaves the final placing of the text in dotted outline. So what he's saying is that the systems of formation do not constitute the uh, don't really constitute the texts, but nor do they stand over the texts and sort of rule over them and make the text just epiphenomenal. He's sort of repeating himself, but he's showing different facets of that same observation is what he's doing. But we must be clear on one point. If analysis stands back in relation to this final construction, it is not to turn away from the discourse and to appeal to the silent work of thought, nor is it to turn away from the systematic and to reveal the living disorder of attempts, trials, errors, and new beginnings. And I have in my notes here, um, you can see I 
have quite a few notes I make, including in the margins. That's why sometimes you see me turn the book like this, like I'm a monkey trying to figure it out or something. No transcendental or ahistoric structure here I have in my notes. But this is also not mere induction. We do systematize, but we do not reify. So what he's saying with that, what that means is that Foucault's not saying, okay, I'm not pulling away the superstructure of discourse and discursive things. I'm not pulling away the superstructure of ideology and uh, fake intellectual vapors and showing the true, naked, pulsating, organic reality under it. That's not what he's saying. It's not what he's remotely trying to do. What he is saying, rather, is that... <clears throat> How to say this. But he's also not saying, okay, we get rid of all the real stuff and just look into pure thought. A lot of people get so enamored of Foucault and so drunk on him, they think he's the master of pure intellection. But that's not what he's trying to do either. What he's saying is that this is just one more method of examining history. And that's it. This is just one more way to look at it. He obviously thinks it's a very important way. He would like other people to do it that way. But fundamentally, this is just one more way to look at the history of ideas. And it is a new way, certainly. Uh, I see I have six viewers now. Uh, if y'all wouldn't mind hitting the like button, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. You will receive my undying, eternal, divine love. And then he says, um, behind the completed system, what is discovered by the analysis of formations is not the bubbling source of life itself, life in an as yet uncaptured state. It is an immense density of systematicities, a tight group of multiple relations. So he's saying when you pull back the curtain on this, what you're seeing is not some organic reality with all of the uh, epiphenomenal ideology or ideology parasitic on the economic base as a Marxist would have it stripped away we're still in the realm of discourse we're still in the realm of words and what we see here is not some bubbling source of life itself you know uh, what we're seeing is this spider web, as it were, this fractal, this immensely complicated interplay of institutional power. Although that's kind of limiting. Really, this immensely this exchange of energy between structures, let's say. And this exchange of energies between structure is mediated in some ways. You know, it's mediated by things like economics, uh, even by natural events like natural disasters or... Uh, or crop failures or what have you. Second microphone's acting up. It's mediated by those, but among, or it's also mediated by the military. You know, if I don't like you, I might attack you. But another thing that mediates the, this energy exchange between structures and human societies is discourse. Humans talking to each other. Even on the uh, very simple, basic, fundamental level of, like, if somebody's going to mug you. Let's, let, let's say someone's about to mug you. You're walking through a dark alley. Somebody's going to mug you. Now, anyone who has been mugged. Well, maybe not anyone. A lot of people who have been mugged or a lot of police officers or a lot of people in martial arts who talk about this kind of thing will tell you that one of the first steps of mugging is the interview. The mugger will talk to a per. They, they usually don't just, like, jump out of an alley and beat the piss out of you. They'll talk to you a little bit first. Hey, man, can I have some money? And if, they, and if you say no, they might try to beat it out of you. So, as we can see, it, it, as we can see, 
a one way that power exchange or the exchange of energy between structures or um, of resources or whatever goes on between humans is by talking, by discourse. The mugger starts by discoursing with you. It's easier to talk you out of your money than to get in a fight. That's dangerous. You might pull out a knife and stab them. They don't know. That's why they always try to talk first, or many of them try to talk first. So, uh, that, that's what I have for now. Um, the next chapter is going to be, uh, we've done chapter 7. And then we're going to do part 8 and do defining the statement. In which Foucault finally gets around to individuating statements. Like, oh, we after all this preparatory analytic and uh, all, after all this groundwork, we can finally uh, say when somebody said something. Holy crap, it took that long to get to this. It's sort of like a, sort of like Alfred North Whitehead and Bertrand Russell spending several chapters of Principia Mathematica laying out definitions of functions and such until they can finally prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Sort of like that, but uh, in sort of a different realm, I suppose. Um, that's all I have for now. Thank you all for showing up. Uh, until next time.